one of the world's great rivers, flows from the heart of Africa. It cuts through the largest rainforest outside the Amazon, with wildlife found nowhere else on Earth. It's amazing. The Democratic Republic of the Congo is a vast, beautiful, but tormented place. This country is rich, but its people are among the world's poorest. For centuries, its resources have been plundered and it's been ravaged by war. From here, you cannot find anybody. They start going, all of them. They will disappear here soon. The violence goes on, and now it's played by Ebola. But some change is coming to this country the size of Western Europe. With elections finally on the horizon, we're setting off on a long and challenging expedition to follow the Congo into the heart of Africa. From the Atlantic Ocean to the heart of the continent, the Congo has always been a place of fear and mystery. The mouth of the river is lined with ancient mangrove swamps. It's an eerie and mysterious start to an epic adventure. This is the point where the Congo River and the Atlantic Ocean meet. Next step is Brazil. It was 1482 when the Portuguese were sailing past this coast and they noticed this surge of brown water and realized there must be a river here. That was the Congo and this is the direction they took. For 3,000 miles, we're gonna take you up this great river to try and understand its history, its riches, its poverty and its future. From the Atlantic Ocean, we'll follow the river to its furthest reaches, navigating round its powerful rapids and through its chaotic capital city, Kinshasa, as it arcs up north and then south, twice crossing the equator. We'll visit its war-torn east, venture into Ebola territory, meet rare gorillas, and find out just how rich this country could be. As they sailed up this first stretch of river, the Portuguese must have dreamed of the great riches that lay ahead. They found a well-organized society, the Kingdom of the Congo, open to their offers of trade. But less than 100 kilometers inland, they hit an obstacle that it would take centuries to get around. The rapids. A series of steep cataracts make this stretch of the Congo impassable by boat. And so this port, Boma, became a European center of trade. Guns and goods came in, ivory and slaves went out. These odd monuments in the town reflect that past. It's not a great likeness, but that's Henry Morton Stanley the first European to travel the Congo from its source to the sea. Stanley was a Welshman who took 999 days to travel here from the eastern coast of Africa. It was an epic journey and opened up the interior of Africa for exploitation. The voyage of Stanley had a beat. The beat, as I have said, when for the Roi Leopold II, c'était à découvrir le Congo parce que quand il avait traversé le pays, il est allé dire aux Anglais, comme je vous ai dit, que j'ai découvert une partie de la terre qui a trop de richesses, mais ce n'est pas colonisé. Si les Anglais avaient accepté, les Anglais, nous, on allait être colonisés par les Anglais. Mais après tout, on lui a demandé d'aller voir le roi Leopold qui avait des possibilités, et celui-là s'est intéressé du Congo. The Belgian king was looking for his own colony. The men met, and the Congo Free State was born. Boma was its capital. This was once the governor general's residence, but it's not a time in history that's remembered fondly.
The powerful rapids that had been the obstacle for so long remain impassable today. But they've also provided great opportunity for hydroelectric power. There are a few places on the planet where rivers run as fast and as hard as the Congo does here as it approaches the sea. A hydroelectric power station built here could provide electricity for the whole of Africa. It would produce twice as much power as any other hydro plant on Earth. That is how rich the Congo could be if the resources were put to good use. They built two small power stations decades ago here at Inga, but there's always been a much more ambitious plan for a grand Inga dam to be built across this whole valley. A deal has recently been signed to make that happen. This project will permit the economic growth of all Africa. Because for the moment, what the Africa has need is a resource that is sure, a resource that is fiable. Because the hydroelectric energy hydroelectric is a propre energy and renewable. And we have sur the site d'Inga in permanent and in quantity. But promises have been made before, and nothing has happened. The story of the Congo is often the story of lost or squandered opportunity. To get around the rapids means we need another form of transport. The railway was built under the orders of Henry Morton Stanley in the 1890s to replace a long and arduous trek. Around that time, Joseph Conrad walked the route to become a steamboat captain upriver. His diary became The Heart of Darkness, a novel whose title created a stereotype that still haunts the DRC today. The trains only run once a week after being derelict for years. It's an opportunity for the villagers along the way to sell as much as they can in a five-minute mobile market. Kinshasa, the Democratic Republic of the Congo's crazy, chaotic capital. Joseph Kabila has been president since 2001, but two years after delayed elections, he's standing down. Kinshasa is one of Africa's biggest and fastest growing cities. It's big and brash and bossy. There's a strange but colorful subculture that's grown out of Kinshasa and across Africa. The sappers, who put their confidence on display. Princess is getting ready for a night out. The French acronym SAP, S-A-P-E, stands for the Society of Ambience Makers and Elegant People, and she certainly fits the bill. SAP goes back to the 1920s, but it was the 60s, after independence, when it came into its own. When the musician Papa Wemba championed an extravagant dress code in direct opposition to the country's leader. President Mobutu decreed Western attire a symbol of colonialism, and it was forbidden. 
Today, thousands of Congolese sappers like Princess celebrate the art of dressing well. From here in Kinshasa, the rapids end and boats can travel the river again. And so begins our long arc up to the equator and to Bandaka to explore life on the river at the first major port. In a vast country with so few roads, this is the Congo Superhighway. Well, this is how people get around a country the size of Western Europe with very little infrastructure connecting it. When there's a huge river, they go by barge. These go all the way from Kinshasa right through to Kisangani, hundreds of miles with many, many stops along the way. And they're like small villages. People eat here, sleep here. They brave the elements and the mosquitoes here as well. And there used to be many, many more of these decades ago. The journey this far has already taken two weeks, and there's at least another week to go. They've been delayed here days by a dispute over unpaid duty on some of the cargo. Bureaucracy and the corruption that comes with it is a blight across the DRC. As long as you've got money, everything's fine. This man's a big fan of travelling by barge. Just like a big family, he says. But as a retired soldier, he's in no rush. Karine Linguli just wants the journey to end. Her husband recently died. She's disabled and has run out of money to buy food for her kids on the boat. She's heading for a new start with a Bible by her side. During the Belgian colonial times, this river really was a highway. Among the traffic were luxury steamboats. The remains now lie rusting along the banks. The workshop's quiet. In many ways, the Congo has gone back in time. It takes just four or five hours driving through the forest to meet people living a very traditional way of life. This is Boyanga village. This pygmy ritual is to wish them good fortune, hunting in the forest. And we are going with them. They're looking for wildlife and useful plants along the way. They block animal holes and use smoke to force them out. It's the way they've always hunted. But a century ago, King Leopold discovered there was something in the forest worth a huge amount of money. Rubber. This white sap from the wild rubber vines could be collected and made into tires for bicycles and then cars. But before rubber plantations industrialized the process, this was the only source, deep in the forest. And so the pygmies were made to collect it. The
The feared whip was called a chicot and made from dried hippo hide. But an even more brutal punishment was common. Some of those who didn't collect enough rubber had their hands cut off. Up to 10 million people died under the regime of King Leopold II. And early photographs of atrocities led to the world's first international human rights campaign. It hastened the end of King Leopold's rule, but his personal colony, which had made him rich, was handed over to Belgium in 1908, only for exploitation and brutality to continue. It was the Belgian Congo until 1960, even though there was little free about it for the Congolese. With independence came retribution and a great white flight from the country. Many Belgians left. The Congolese were handed a place rich with natural resources, but without the knowledge and training to use them. Such was the colonial style that few people were qualified doctors, academics, or tested leaders. The country was cast adrift. The rainforest is perhaps the Congo's most precious asset. The largest outside the Amazon and a valuable sink for the carbon dioxide that's warming our planet. But demand for charcoal means it's going up in smoke. A solution to that is being explored in a nature reserve on a remote bank of the Congo River. Yangambi was the world's largest tropical forest research station. Hundreds of expats and their families lived and studied here until they left in the Congo crisis. At that point, everything ground to a halt. Yangambi is home to a remarkable collection of plants going back nearly a century. The Congolese workers stayed on without pay and protected the precious archives. Today, they're being restored. We cut a portion of the tree on the level of the forest, and we put it first on the level of the temperature. And then, when we cut the temperature, we put it on the level of the temperature, so it's like this. There are more than 150,000 samples in the herbarium, which is being restored and rejuvenated, as it still has scientific value today for climate change research. They're planting fast-growing trees to be turned into charcoal instead of the rainforest. And there's a bigger plan to generate electricity from biomass, burning an old, unproductive rubber plantation and then using these new trees to create a sustainable source of fuel. It's the usual balance between conservation and economic growth, and it's a battle being fought along the length of the Congo. So when the river pilot Joseph Conrad traveled this stretch of the Congo a century ago, one of his biggest worries was stranding his steamship on a sandbank. Ah, the lessons of history. We get the chance to stand in the middle of the Congo River. We uh, got stuck. Uh, we just keep going into different sandbanks. We've all managed to get it going again, so we're back in business. History has a habit of repeating itself in the Congo. We're taking a detour to another place, from another era, but equally trapped in time. From the port at Bandaka, we're following a tributary up to the very northern edge of the DRC, to Badalite, a small town that's played a large part in the country's history. This strangely haunting place was the home of the man who ruled the Congo for more than 30 years. A dictator who renamed the country Zaire. President Mobutu Sese Seko. Welcome to what's left of his jungle palace. In its day, this was the height of opulence. 
it's painful for me to come here. How the people destroy this palace in shock to me. Chief Asambia Kopwata Fifi is one of his daughters. What's it like? Very, very, very beautiful. At the entrance in your left on the road, there were one Picasso's painting. The many rituals. After independence, Mobutu became the army chief of staff. He arrested Patrice Lumumba, the country's first prime minister, who had turned to the Soviet Union after being shunned by the West. With the Cold War backing of Belgium and the CIA, Mobutu handed Lumumba to the rebels to be killed. His body was cut up and dissolved in acid. He is normally reclusive and camera shy. It builds his mystique. The scale and pomp of this highly visible ceremony are designed to bolster his fast diminishing authority. It is also an unwitting acknowledgement that he knows he's in trouble. Mobutu transformed himself into a classic African dictator after becoming president in a 1965 coup. Political opponents and rivals were killed or tortured. His regime was totalitarian and corrupt. He got rich while the country got poor. What was he like as a person? A generous person. I tell you the truth, it's not only because it's my family, no. He lacked all the children, he lacked his family. He's been alleged to have been a terrible president, um, brutal. Oh, brutal. I don't think so. <laughs> if you're brutal, you have to start it with your family. He never bites one of child, no, never. But it all came crashing down in 1997. An invasion and a coup forced Mobutu out, and he died in exile. It's when the looting here began, and when time stopped in Badalite. This international airport was built in the middle of a jungle. It was a vanity project. That was a plush VIP reception area. This, a huge terminal. Concorde landed here, bringing in luxury goods like pink champagne for then present Mobutu. Today, it's just a shell. The money just dried up. This distant town on the edge of the country owed its privileged position to one man, and he'd gone. A while ago, the town's hydroelectric power station broke down. It takes three months for generator fuel to come upriver from Kinshasa, and then another 10 days or so for a tanker to negotiate a flood-damaged dirt road. The lights are off in Badalite. But we have to get back onto the river and head upstream, past Yangambi and on to Kisangani, the end of the line for river traffic, where rapids block the way but once again provide an opportunity. The Wagania fishermen use the white water to help them with their catch. From an early age, they learn how to use the deadly currents to check their nets, secure their ropes, and survive the raging rapids. These huge wicker baskets trap the fish. So when the water's really high, there are hundreds of these guys out here with hundreds of these nets and they're pulling in huge fish. The water's not as high at the moment. You can see how dangerous it is today. Imagine when this is in full flood. It's crazy. They're brought up from little kids to do this and they do it very skillfully. Every young boy has to go through the ritual of learning to swim. 
of understanding the twists and turns of the current. It's his first plunge into a tough life on the river. It was touch and go, but eventually he made it to safety. From here, the main river channel turns south, but we are going to keep going. The worst affected part of the country is the east, far from the capital and close to neighboring Rwanda and Uganda, and their designs on the mineral wealth this side of the Congo. And we're starting in Goma before heading even further into trouble. This city is home to a towering active volcano. This region is the epicenter of wars which have raged for the past two decades. Millions of people died in the fighting and in the humanitarian crisis that followed. Scores of armed groups are still active in this region today. You have these local conflicts that often displace hundreds of thousands of people. And there's an active Ebola outbreak. Welcome to the Eastern Congo. And this is where things are going to start getting dicey. The violence here started after the genocide in Rwanda in 1994, as Rwandan troops followed the killers over the border. Rebels backed by the neighbors marched on the east and kept going. By May 1997, Mobutu was out, and mob justice was turned on his enforcers. His successor was the rebel leader Laurent Kabila, the warlord turned statesman. Je jure. But just a year later, rebel soldiers supported by Rwanda and Uganda launched a rebellion against Kabila. Swift regional diplomacy and the offer of mining rights brought him Zimbabwean, Angolan and Namibian support to drive out the Rwandan-backed forces. It turned one country's crisis into a regional war. Over the years, millions died. Millions more were forced from burned homes. Despite a peace deal, militants splintered and spread. After his father's assassination in 2001, Joseph Kabila took over as president. The violence continues today. We're flying with United Nations peacekeepers into one of the most dangerous parts of the country, Beni, in North Kivu. You're on patrol with us, with the United Nations forces here, going out into quite a dangerous area. Uh, there's a bowler nearby, uh, and also there are, is a very strong um, militant group here that over the last few days has killed probably dozens of civilians. The group is called the ADF. Uh, they're a group that have been around 20 years and they're living in the forests. There's huge impenetrable forests just to the east of this area. They act in there, they do hit and run attacks, they kill civilians, they target UN vehicles like this one and they target the, uh, the local Democratic Republic of Congo forces as well. So we're going to a village and then we're going to get out, walk around, see what happens. They just want to show that they're here. First of all, the UN Malawian troops chat to the locals just to get an idea of what's going on, if it's dangerous or not, and to show their presence in the area. From here, you cannot find anybody. They start going, all of them. They will disappear here soon. So we're just uh, meeting one of the community leaders here, but the translators just said that basically there's nobody from here on in further up to this side because of the, uh, the militants that are in the area. It's also weird because kids around here normally would go, hi there, and shake hands. Can't touch anybody. We've been given very strict instructions. Don't touch anybody because of the risk of Ebola in this area. The UN isn't popular here. 
People are suspicious of soldiers, particularly from Western countries. They are wondering how can the enemy cross all of this bush and reach the town and start killing people just there at the town. So for them, they are feeling bad because they have suffered a lot. It's best not to hang around too long. After a short patrol around the town, it was straight back to base. It's hard to get much done when safety is such an issue and they're only on the ground for a short period of time. The UN funding has been cut and they're taking a new approach to getting forces with tougher rules of engagement out to the most dangerous places. It's a difficult balance for the commander. We have only two ways to, to really protect the civilian population here. It's to be able to deploy preventively to arrive in the village, in the area where the civilians are, before the armed groups, is one. And the second one is to go after the armed groups which are imposing threats to this civilian population. The spokesman for the government says it wants the UN out by 2020, the whole UN. What would happen if you left? I believe that the uh, UN is making the difference here because uh, the state is not present in many areas of this country. There are remote areas here where we don't see the presence of the state. So if we left the area, I believe that the situation, based on the current environment, the situation could worsen very quickly. The situation here is already worsening. With increased attacks and the spread of Ebola across this part of the country, Much of the eastern Congo is in a state of conflict and instability. Historical tensions across this whole region often spark terrible violence, as happened in Kalemi, our next stop, down on the shores of Lake Tanganyika. When situations worsen in the DRC, this is what happens people get forced from their homes into camps. Two years ago, a row over sharing a bowl of forest caterpillars sparked violent clashes between pygmies and other ethnic groups. Inflamed by the politicians, it displaced three quarters of a million people. They're queuing up to make sure they're on the list for cash payments due to be given by the UN the following week. Aid workers check names to make sure they don't get too little or too much of what they're entitled to. There are still many of these camps scattered across the town after the ethnic-based violence erupted into a brutal tit-for-tat of attacks. It's still too dangerous for most to go home, and terrible things were done by both sides. We met Estelle. One morning, the war came to her village without warning. She was abused by them. They killed a woman and three men in front of her. It took Estelle two months to walk 200 kilometers to escape the fighting. She now has little to feed her five children. Her four-year-old twins died here. These hillsides are dry and exposed. The wind can whip up a small fire in no time, and there's little water to spare. It's not surprising people panic. A nearby camp was recently burnt to the ground. 
Life is tense and desperate. Everyone's on edge, just about surviving. But the slightest thing can spark a fight. This was over those burnt possessions. Across this country, there are 14 million people who need aid just to stay alive. Five million people have been driven from their homes by fighting. We could have gone to so many places, but we've come here where hundreds of thousands of people have been forced from their villages to live in these kinds of camps or in local communities. They've been attacked and targeted in an ethnic fight, treated brutally and sadistically. There are scores of armed groups across this country. It's usually about strong men wanting more power, but it's also about a government that doesn't have control in these places. That has always been the story of the Congo. It was built that way. Violence and suffering is burned into its DNA, so much so that it's sometimes hard to see beyond. But in a young, vibrant and beautiful country, there is hope. Travelling towards the furthest reaches of the river, we're going to explore the rich mining regions of Katanga. But first, we're going back into the forest in search of something truly unique in Kahuzi Biega National Park. It's home to a critically endangered species, the Eastern Lowland Gorillas. There are many gorilla families scattered through this forest, but four have been habituated. They're not afraid of humans and don't attack. They are who we're looking for. There is bamboo shoot here. It's the time of year when the gorillas feed on bamboo. Yes. We're following the mess they leave behind. They've been here. This is 10 minutes here. Really? Yes, Just 10 yes. Minutes. 10 minutes here ago, they've been here. Well, we spend probably a couple of hours now in the jungle cutting through, following places where they've uh, been eating the bamboo shoots. We think we're getting close. A couple of times we've heard them, but the guys are still trying to pick up the trail now. After three hours, we got our first glimpse just a few meters ahead. There's another one as well. That's the silverback. The young ones caught us by surprise, coming so close. The masks we're wearing protect the gorillas from our germs. There are probably fewer than 5,000 eastern lowland gorillas left in a fraction of the land they used to inhabit. Being comfortable with humans allows visitors to come to help pay for the conservation, but it's risky for them with poachers and militant groups in the area. The first danger for gorilla is just the man. But since the jungle is not dangerous in the jungle, because they're feeding leaves, they're feeding fruit, they're feeding bamboo. <laughs> not dangerous for our gorilla here in Kawisbjerg National Park. And after the war in here in Congo, 
those gorilla family, the number is increasing for our gorilla and it's very important. It's a truly magical and unique experience. But again, there's that struggle between preserving nature and using the country's resources for economic growth when people are so poor. The Congo's mineral wealth is a freak of nature. Its earth is packed with metal ores like copper, coltan and cobalt, gold, diamonds, uranium, with vast seams in this part of Africa. The colonizers extracted and exploited. Many bullets fired in the First World War came from Congolese metal. And the uranium for the bombs that ended the second came from here. Copper was the key commodity, but what was once thrown away as a byproduct of that process has become its most valuable asset, cobalt. Cobalt was worth nothing until it became a key ingredient in electric car batteries. 60% of the world's supply is found in this part of the Congo. Once the ore has been broken up, it's a chemical refining process. Sulfuric acid in these huge vats leaches out different metals. It burns your nose and throat. Electrolysis transforms the liquid into sheets of copper. As the cobalt heads elsewhere to be dried and packed. So this is the final product. This is 35% cobalt. It will be refined further, but this is what they export from here. You can see the green color. This is uh, basically what goes into your electric car battery, stops it from catching fire. This has doubled in price in the last couple of years. That's how much in demand it is. Wealth like this should transform a country, but the exploitation continues by big businesses and for personal gain. We have a lot of resources, and these resources has been, uh, have been uh, our malediction. But at the same moment, these resources, if we can really uh, manage them very well and uh, stop people to be there just to loot without transforming, at least partially here, uh, we can make it. Is it corruption that's eaten away at the wealth of this country? Yes, corruption is one of uh, um, challenges among which uh, we, we have to deal with. And the corruption also is a bad habit we have inherited when we got independence. The, the bad habits have to be fought, and it is a, one of our main program. We can't say that we have won, but still we are trying really to finish it because we can't uh, maintain being a very rich country with a very poor people. This can't be accepted at all. As the country votes in long-delayed elections, the hope for change and an end to corruption are on the ballot. But there's fear the process won't be free or fair. Controversial electronic voting machines are being used, and some opposition leaders have been barred from standing. For a long time now, a strong voice of opposition has come from the pews of the Catholic Church, as peaceful protests have been met with violence. Many critics have been forced underground, which is why we had to secretly meet a couple of young activists from a group called Lucha, or Struggle for Change. Gisling Mahiwa was jailed for six months for leading illegal protests. He says he was recently beaten so badly he spent three days in hospital. Des élections où il y a la sécurité, mais des élections avec un fichier fiable, parce que le fichier que nous avons aujourd'hui, ce n'est pas un fichier fiable. Il a 16% des électeurs fictifs. They arrived separately. They were nervous, and we had to do the interview quickly. 
It's dangerous here to speak as openly as this. À cause de la guerre, il y a des femmes qui sont violées chaque jour. Nous enregistrons des femmes qui sont violées. Il y a des enfants qui sont enrôlés dans des groupes armés. With Joseph Kabila not taking part, there is going to be a change in leadership. The majority hope it will be for the better, that the huge potential of the Congo will finally be realized. This journey up the Congo River has shown us just how beautiful and how huge a country this is. How rich it is in so many ways. History has been cruel to the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Exploited by the early European explorers, by Belgium and its cruel king. And then through the last six decades of greedy Congolese leadership and war. But its river could power Africa. Its minerals could lift the nation from poverty. Its young people could transform it into the glittering, beating heart of Africa, rather than that of its dark and stereotypical image. If you'd like to take an even more immersive journey up the Congo River in virtual reality, visit bbc.com slash virtual reality to find out how.